Hey everybody, happy Memorial Day. Hope everybody's having a good uh, final day of your long weekend and uh, enjoying the extra day off. Um, we uh, did something that we haven't done in over two months today, which was actually engage in a uh, somewhat social activity um, in celebration of Memorial Day. Helen's uh, immediate family put together a small gathering at her um, at the cemetery where her grandparents are buried uh, in order to honor her grandfather who uh, served in the Korean War and was a veteran and so on Memorial Day um, you know a small gathering there both of Helen's grandparents passed away uh, last year and this was the first time we actually saw the, the, the gravestone which is like really nice um, nice piece of rock and uh, the engraving was really nice. Nice little like picture engraved with a sailboat on it because he loved to sail and nice flowers because um, Helen's grandmother loved flowers. And anyway, uh, we gathered at about two o'clock, uh, kept social distance apart, um, but it was nice to at least, you know, see other people. Um, it was uh, Helen's sister, Helen's parents, uh, and then Helen's aunt and her husband. And um, just had a nice little, you know, picnic, had a glass of wine, um, and sat around and chatted for a half hour or so. And it was nice to like actually have some social connection, even if we couldn't touch each other or get close to each other or anything like that, um, while also remembering and honoring her grandparents, which was really nice. And it got warm, you know, we were, the, the temperature, I think the reported, recorded temperature is like in the 60s today, but you know, sitting out there in the sun, uh, in the early afternoon was it like got a little like warm and it was almost like a little bit humid uh, It was a little buggy the first time I was really like had some bugs in my face this year. So Anyway, uh, that was interesting. Otherwise, I had a pretty easy going morning today um, and uh, What I'm most excited about for the coming week is it's supposed to heat up again starting tomorrow I think be at or above 80 for the next four days and so I have decided that this is the week that I upgrade my morning routine. Typically my morning routine has been to um, wake up either at 6.05 a.m. if it's my turn to feed the dogs, um, or a little bit later than that if uh, Helen is on dog duty. Um, but to get up, get a cup of coffee, um, and I've been sitting down, sort of like putting on the TV and doing the crossword puzzle, the Times crossword puzzle for the day in the morning. Uh, as I drink my coffee, and normally I'd have like uh, Morning Joe on on MSNBC or something like that. But this is the week that I'm going to make the upgrade and um, take that al fresco and start doing my morning coffee outdoors, um, which I, is just like my favorite way to start the day. It's so nice to be able to, you know, sit outside and drink a cup of coffee and just be outside. And even if the days are getting hot, you know, it's not hot yet in the morning like that and uh, just hang out. So. Excited to start that. Hopefully we'll do it tomorrow. I have like a strange week this week. Um, some of my normal meetings are canceled because at the high school we're giving final exams this week. So the schedule is a little bit different there, but I also uh, have a remote Zoom professional development session that I'm going to tomorrow morning. So that'll be interesting. That'll be sort of my first um, remote, uh, remote PD session, you know, like being in a, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see uh, exactly how that they manage that and handle that. They've already been sort of like upfront about setting expectations around the like, I mean, obviously like make sure your camera's on the whole time, make sure like, make sure you're muted and all the, the tech pieces, but also like for engagement in terms of the like, you know, you should like push the button to like raise your hand to participate at least once in the session and that sort of thing. So I feel like what we've learned with students is that, you know, in theory, the idea of like a flipped classroom where you can like have students watch a video to get the intro to new material and then, you know, spend the time with the teacher, if we were in person, actually just like giving feedback and, you know, working with them specifically is great in theory, but the real issue is like, how do you keep kids engaged through all of that? And I think with adult learning, it's the same thing as how do you keep adults engaged for a long period of time when, uh, you're trying to get across information, but 
Uh, there's no, there's none of that like social, physical accountability for you being totally present. So I'm going to do my best to stay totally present the whole time. Uh, it's, it's nine to one tomorrow. So four hours, I'm sure there'll be a short break, uh, in the middle, but, um, we'll, we'll do that. We also, um, <clears throat> Helen, I think is probably a little bit nervous, but, um, have our, um, the woman that, uh, has been cleaning our house for the last five or six years, um, will, uh, is coming tomorrow for the first time in, you know, since early March. Um, and so it'll be nice to have the house clean and have our, you know, I've been trying to keep up with the vacuuming and cleaning the bathrooms and whatnot, but, um, we, uh, are going to have somebody from the outside in our house for the first time in a long time. So that's a little bit weird, but, um, I'm sure that'll be, That'll be nice too, and we're just gonna try to like stay out of her way, but it's also not the sort of thing where I can like go to the like work at a coffee shop or something like that because she because we can't go work at a coffee shop. So anyway, that's all really interesting. So excited for tonight's cocktail. We're making a sealback cocktail, and uh, the story behind this is actually quite a little bit interesting. And so to kick things off, um, I want to turn to what is one of my favorite books, The Great Gatsby. And if you go to the fourth chapter of The Great Gatsby, there's a portion where Jordan Baker is sort of like giving an account of um, her friend Daisy Buchanan and what Daisy, um, you know, sort of Daisy's life and his relationship with Tom. And at one point, um, at one point she says... Um, she had a debut after the armistice, and in February, she was presumably engaged to a man from New Orleans. In June, she married Tom Buchanan of Chicago with more pomp and circumstance than Louisville ever knew before. He came down with a hundred people in four private cars and hired a whole floor of the Sealback Hotel. The Sealback Hotel, here uh, in this, right, gets a place in... The Great Gatsby, and The Great Gatsby, obviously fictional, the Sealback Hotel, very much uh, a real hotel in Louisville, Kentucky. And it's one of these like grand, old, old South mansion style um, hotels that is, you know, quite famous and just really like uh, extravagant and uh, has seen a famous, you know, clientele throughout time. They, uh, I think it was the movie The Hustler, with Paul Newman and Jackie Gleason. They filmed a scene in, in one of the rooms, in one of the like uh, the ballrooms of this hotel. And F. Scott Fitzgerald himself is said to have frequented there. Uh, and there are some stories that he, from the people in the hotel, got some of the inspiration for The Great Gatsby. That's the, the through line about how accurate or true that is, isn't really as clear, but uh, Fitzgerald drank there. There's stories of Al Capone uh, staying there and spending time there. And so this hotel has just a really rich storied history in Louisville all the way down to the beginning of the 20th century. And so why do I bring all this up? Well, I bring all this up because um, in the 1990s, there was a director of their sort of like food and beverage programs at the hotel um, named... Adam Seeger, not Adam Seeger. Yeah, named Adam Seeger. Is that right? Yeah, Adam Seeger. So he in the 90s is like, all right, I've got this like super um, historic, cool hotel that has these like deep ties into the early 1900s and that rich, um, you know, pre-prohibition and even into, pre into prohibition uh, drinking culture of the jazz age and the great Gatsby. Like, I feel like I can, I should be able to tie in this rich history to this, um, to our cocktails. And he's like, there's gotta be some historic connection to a great cocktail that I can like bring back and, and resurrect and, you know, maybe, maybe tweak or whatever, um, to make a great cocktail. And so he starts and he finds this, um, this trove of like really old, uh, restaurant and bar menus from the early 1900s. And he comes across this drink. Um, and he's like, oh, like that's, that seems like a really interesting drink. There's a whole lot of bitters in it. That's really interesting. That's kind of crazy. It's a champagne drink. Like what's going on with this? Um, there's bourbon in it, which, you know, makes sense for, for Louisville. 
And so this like seems like a really cool drink. And so he starts like talking to some other people um, that have sort of historical connections in the Kentucky area. And he comes across this other guy who knows a lot about uh, the bourbon industry and who has family that goes way back to the early 1900s. And, uh, and bourbon is like, hey, would you know anything? Do you know anything about this cocktail? And the other guy goes, oh, you know what? Like, I, you know, that's familiar. Um, there's, this, uh, there's this story about at the Sealback Hotel that a uh, couple came in and one of them ordered a Manhattan, which is, you know, a, a bourbon or rye drink with sweet vermouth. And then another one ordered uh, like a champagne cocktail. So they've got some bitters and the sugar cube and some champagne. And he was making them and the bartender accidentally like spilled one into the other. And so he just kind of like poured them together, put them aside and then remade their drinks and gave it to them. But then later on, he went back to this drink and was like, huh, like this is actually an interesting idea. And he tweaked it a little bit and came up with this cocktail, the sealed back cocktail. And so this guy, um, this guy, Adam Seeger is like, oh, like this is, <laughs> this is awesome. This is perfect. Uh, this, you know, this has this cool historical connection. Turns out it's a really good drink. We're gonna bring it back. We're gonna put it on the menu. And so he starts making it and he, uh, he does the thing that a lot of bartenders do where he will, he'll like pre-batch with all of these bitters and he uses Angostura and Peychaud's bitters and a lot of each of them. And so he'll pre-batch a bunch of those with the, um, with the Cointreau and the bourbon. And so basically the bartenders just have to mix that with the champagne and they're done and they have the sealed back cocktail. Um, but it was kind of a secret what's in it for, for a bit of time. Um, then comes along this guy, Gary Regan, Gaz Regan. What you need to know about Gary Regan is he uh, is an author. He's a writer. He, he writes a ton about um, cocktails, cocktail history, cocktail books. Um, and at the time in the late 1990s, he was working on this book called um, Vintage, what was it called? called New Classic Cocktails, which is all about like vintage cocktails that we're bringing back. And he's like, oh, like this is the perfect candidate for my book. And so he sort of like begged and begged and begged and eventually got permission uh, in order to both figure out exactly what the recipe is for this cocktail, but two also to then make it um, and put it in the book. And so it was put in the book and um, Sort of the rest is history from there. You know, other other places picked it up. Other people were uh, starting to make it, beat its way into some other books, and now we have this, um, you know, this awesome, really cool cocktail. Fast forward about uh, twenty years, <laughs> a little bit less, um, but then in like the early two thousand teens, maybe two thousand fifteen, two thousand sixteen. The New York Times prints an article in early 2016 that the whole story that I just told you is made up. He totally fabricated the whole thing. He never found early menus. He never, you know, got this account about this like story of a Manhattan and a champagne cocktail accidentally getting mixed up. And, you know, he just wanted to sort of market and bring about, make this cocktail that, um, this cocktail on his menu that was able to draw on the historical roots of the hotel and market it that way that he, he just made it up. And he expressed some guilt at the time around the like, oh, like now Gary Regan's coming and wants the recipe. And I, you know, and, and now it's like, feels like a real book and a real history book. And he, uh, it's, it seems like a story where he just kind of got deeper and deeper into, into it. Um, and felt bad and, and eventually came clean, albeit uh, decades later. And so what we do know is that he made, made up this cocktail and it's a really good cocktail. It's a really fun cocktail to make. Um, so there's no shame in that. And I have mixed feelings about like how I feel about this and how I feel about the academic honesty. Um, on the one hand, there is like a really rich history of bartenders, you know, fighting for or claiming credit or, or you know, giving a, giving a mixed up history for marketing reasons or just to take their own glory. Uh, and in fact, he wasn't doing it to take glory for this recipe. He's just saying he found it. He wasn't taking credit for it. Um, on the other hand, there is something to, you know, I feel like uh, the past 15 years has been marked by um, a newfound... Uh, newfound academic study of cocktail history, which has really just enriched the cocktail world generally. And so it is um, tough that 
uh, that he betrayed us in that way. So really interesting. Megan saying still a good story. It is still a good story, I think, too. Um, and it is true that, you know, the hotel is in the book and it is apparently this, it's owned by Hilton now, I believe. Um, but, you know, it's a real hotel. F. Scott Fitzgerald apparently drank there, although it's said, too, that F. Scott Fitzgerald drank at more establishments than Lincoln slept at. I don't know if you've heard that quote, but um, he was uh, quite a drinker. Um, so how do we make this cocktail? Well, we start with the sort of the base, which is our bourbon, some Cointreau, and a whole lot of bitters. We get that nice and cold, and then we add it to our uh, glass and top it with champagne, and that's it. So let's start with the bitters. Now, this recipe calls for seven dashes of Angostura bitters and seven dashes of Peixades bitters. Whew, that is a lot of bitters. The other thing that's tricky about this recipe is how much a dash is, is wildly inconsistent. And in fact, there's stories saying that Angostura uh, widened the, um, the dasher hole on their bottle and by doing that, increase their sales by 30%, because suddenly people are blowing through Angostura bitters a lot faster. So the, the, the amount that you get out of a dash has not been consistent over time, and the amount that you would get from one bottle to another also isn't consistent. And even within a bottle, I've heard it been said that you will get a different amount in a dash depending on how full the bottle is. So even thinking that you can stay consistent within one bottle and one dasher top, you can't even do that. Um, so it's, you, you kind of have to get a feel for, uh, how many, how much bitters that you want to put in there. And, uh, it also worries me that the, the seven dashes of each from 1996, when he was first making this is actually, uh, less than what we would get from seven dashes now. So I'm thinking I'm going to do like a healthy five dashes of each and that should get us started. Yeah, I'll do seven. We'll do seven. We'll go for it all the way. Um, because I like my bitters and we just really want them to come through. So next we have the Peixage bitters. So Angostura, obviously the number one most famous bitters. Peixage bitters, uh, number two, classic New Orleans, um, New Orleans bitter. Also aromatic bitters, but um, have this beautiful red color. So we'll do seven dashes of that. And so now we have this base of just a ton of bitters. Look at all that. Beautiful color, mm, such rich flavor. We're gonna sweeten this up just a bit with half an ounce of Cointreau. Remember Cointreau is just the best form of triple sec. And then um, this takes an ounce of bourbon. Um, I'm gonna use a sort of barrel strength high proof Bourbon, this is 62% by uh, ABV. And the reason for that is we're only using an ounce and this is gonna be diluted by the champagne. So I feel like uh, if you're ever gonna use a, um, if you're ever gonna use a uh, high proof bourbon, like this is it, right? Something that can like stand up to the champagne and it's gonna get diluted a little bit anyway. Um, so there we have that. And we're gonna get this nice and cold. So I'm gonna add my ice. And let's stir. We have a small amount of bourbon sweetened by a little Cointreau and then uh, just a ton of bitters, seven dashes each. 
of Angostura and Peshaj bitters. And the reason that we can have such a strong base is because now we're just going to top it off with our sparkling wine. So here we have another bottle of uh, Frexinet, which is the Spanish cava. Happy Memorial Day. And we'll top it off. In our nice coupe. Um, and then uh, for garnish, I'm just going to take this orange and let me grab my um, slicer here. Turns out I need a quick rinse, but have our orange. Gonna take a nice big thick slice of orange, express it over the top, and give it a rub, drop it in, and here we have the Sealback cocktail. Cheers everyone, happy Memorial Day. Super tasty. This is kind of like a drinking man's French 75. You know, French 75 has uh, lemon juice, gin, and simple syrup. It's like sweeter, lighter uh, gin. This one has like bourbon, no simple syrup, just a little bit of, of Cointreau and a ton of bitters, um, but then both of them topped by the champagne. And uh, it's good, you get those bitter flavors in there. Um, the bourbon comes through a little bit, um, but it's all sort of lightened up and given that effervescence from the sparkling wine that is really quite nice. So there we have it, the Sealback cocktail, the cocktail that had, um, for a little while, a really interesting rich history that all turned out to be you know, deep-seated deception and lies um, that went unexposed for decades um, until just recently we figured out its truth. But a fun story nonetheless, um, and a nice way to wrap up our Memorial Day weekend. It's five o'clock, why not have a drink with me? Cheers, everyone. Have a fantastic rest of your day and weekend.